Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour brought to you by CEI. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we focus on millennials, and in particular, the educational challenges they face stepping into the world of business. Our first half hour features Neely Benapudi, Dean of the Kansas University School of Business, who gives the view from the heartland. The second half of the show, we'll check in with Gloria Larson, president of Bentley University right here in Boston. But first, the Jayhawks. Neely, welcome to the show. Oh, good morning, Bill. It's a pleasure to be with you. (laughs) I had the pleasure of meeting you early this week when I gave a talk at KU titled Innovation in Challenging Times, the Millennial Curse. Uh, I met met a bunch of students. The basic theme is that we baby boomers have not only made a mess out of the economy, but we've loaded up the next generation with so much debt including trillions in unfunded entitlement liabilities that they're going to have to pay when we retire. Only an innovation miracle is going to let them dig out. Neely, what do you make of that? Are your students up for the challenge? I think they absolutely are. I must say that your talk was very provocative. I think you scared them as you wanted to. (laughs) I wanted to make them angry, too. I think you did. And uh, at the same time, the way you posed the challenge, I think, was very appropriate. And I certainly believe the students here are very much up for it. I say that for a number of reasons. Clearly, when I look at the students here, our state motto is ad astra per aspera, you know, reaching for the stars yeah. through difficulties. And that's kind of the life experience of many of our students as well. They are hardy. They are, uh, you know, children of the prairie. Yeah, this is yeoman farmer country, isn't it? Absolutely. And so there's a resoluteness, there's a perseverance, there is a, an optimism that really captures the American heartland. So I definitely believe they're up for the challenge. But let's look at that for a minute. When I think of the heartland, I think of honesty, integrity, and perseverance. When I think of innovation, I think of the coasts. You know, I think of Boston and Palo Alto. Where does the heartland fit into that? That may have been historically true, but that is no longer true, because if you look at what is happening with Kansas City, whether you look at the entire Midwest, actually, there's a whole renaissance of the Silicon Prairie, and people may not be aware of it. The second thing that happens is part of the media bias that you talked about, Mm -hmm. because stories from the coast get so much more play. But if you look at what is happening in the heartland, think about Google Fiber. Kansas City was the first place to get this innovative service. That is truly spurring so much innovation. And the good news for us is that venture capital is finally realizing that this is a great opportunity. I would say there's one more aspect to this whole renaissance Mm -hmm. of the Midwest, if you will, because this was the frontier. This is where the innovation happened. I find that a lot of people who've made their fortunes on the coast, they're raising their children, they're ready to come back. So we have a whole group of people who've come back. They've gone out, learned from the coast, and they've come back to the Midwest. So I feel that's really grounds for great optimism. Well, there are, there are certainly quality of life differences between raising a family in what we call the flyover states, if you don't mind me saying so. I mean, the closest I had gotten to Kansas City in the last 25 years is about 30,000 feet on a, on a pretty regular basis. People there do seem to be uh, pretty happy with, with where they are, with what they're doing. The question that arises, though, is that are they going to get the economic resources? Are they going to be able to engage with the global economy as easily as people on the coasts? A good point. In fact, we embrace and make fun of the flyover country. <laughs> it's as bad as the you're not in Kansas anymore. It's a myth perpetuated, and you know, it's fine. Here we chuckle about it. In fact, one of our alumni who's uh, started a very successful venture capital co- a firm back in Kansas City, I think, calls it flyover capital or something <laughs> like that. So I think that the key for us is to make it okay for our students to fail. And that's the one big difference I see. And part of it is when you work really hard to get to college and your parents had to take debt or Mm -hmm. you had to take on debt or this is your first generation going to college, there's a little bit of natural, very understandable fear of taking too much risk. Well, there's a farmer conservatism. You know, when the farm fails, there's not a lot of second chances. That's exactly right. And so that's the aspect where we need a safety net for them. And by that, I mean not just financial, but really a whole buddy system where they know they're not alone, that there's a whole lot of peers going through this. I loved what you said in your talk, uh, knowing that businesses are happy to hire you, 
even if your first venture failed, as long as you can show that you're honest about it, you own up to what you learned. Yeah. And I loved your line that you learned on someone else's uh, <laughs> dime in, in many cases. Yeah, you got a million dollar education on someone else's million dollars. Now that cycle of trying, that cycle of going up for the multiple at-bats in the entrepreneurial world, which we all take for granted on the coasts, and anyone who's done serial entrepreneurship you know, in the major technology centers knows what that's like. How do you graft that onto that heartland culture? I think that we're doing it through a couple of different ways. One is encouraging our students. We actually pay for them to go on these trips around the country to go visit with these entrepreneurs, take a look at what they're doing, learn from them. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said, our alumni that come back makes a big difference. Let me just talk about these tours and trips. Recently, it's not just traveling within the United States. We had a group of students go to Israel and spend two weeks Startup there. Startup nation, right. Yeah, right. absolutely. Startup nation. And building those connections. The refreshing thing for us when we take our students there is they come away with the confidence that they realize because they are so pleasantly surprised by how impressed people are with our students invariably, whether it's a big company that we take them to to interview or they meet with entrepreneurs, people come away very impressed because the kids that we, well, young men and women mm -hmm. that we educate, <laughs> I say that they're the intersection of smart and nice. I really do. They're incredibly smart kids. They uh, need the world sometimes to recognize that. And then they are hardworking they don't have huge attitudes. It's just truly a pleasure to be around them. You know, having done business with a lot of different types, including folks from the Midwest, there is this natural advantage they seem to have in their frankness, their openness, their lack of guile. And you don't get a sense that you've constantly got to be on your guard that they're trying to put one over on you the way you do, for example, when you deal with New Yorkers. I mean, it's just, and I'm a New Yorker, so I can say that. It is a different kind of culture, and it's the grafting of the two ought to produce some strengths, but it ought to also produce some, some mix. I mean, are they willing to get up and live the kind of mobile life that people on the coast do? You're not necessarily going to raise your children, you know, in the same town as your parents, sure. which is one of the values that comes out there. Are they ready for that? That's an interesting point, and it remains to be seen because some of these trends play out over decades. You know, we have to see what happens in the years to come. But the one thing I do want to do, though, is to make sure that they have enough opportunities here that if they choose to be here, that they can, because so many businesses, as you think about it, are increasingly location agnostic. There's not a reason yeah. that you have to be on the coast. All you need is broadband. Yeah, that's exactly right, and we've got it. No, and it makes a big difference, particularly with cloud services and lowering the cost of entry for a lot of these things. I mean, you, you lose a little bit of the nexus phenomenon in that when I came out to talk to your students and they heard some of my stories, we breathe that in the air here in Boston. There's hundreds and hundreds of guys like me wandering around Boston that students can come in contact with. That's a little tougher out in the Midwest. There may be definitely an element of truth to that. There's two aspects to it, though. One is that we have had such successful homegrown entrepreneurs here. I don't know if you've heard of Sunder Corporation that is in Kansas City. I believe that about 40% of the medical records of the country are held there, processed mm -hmm. there. They have the systems. It's one of the largest. And it was started by somebody who went to our business school, Cliff Illig, who is still very connected with the school, comes back to talk about it or talk about Freight Quote, another company that started in Kansas City that really has revolutionized how shippers contact mm -hmm. transportation. Real world businesses, not just apps for your iPhone. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. The other challenge we face, though, is part of the Midwest nice is a reluctance to talk publicly about your successes, which is extremely endearing on the one hand, but on the other hand, it deprives our students of hearing about these incredible... Entrepreneurs have to be self-promotional. And it that just... is a hard lesson sometimes for our students. But one of the things we're trying to do, Bill, is an opportunity through our new business school building that's coming up is to be able to tell those stories. You and I are simpatico on so many different aspects, but this is certainly one of them because I am convinced no human being, not just a student. Nobody remembers years. Nobody remembers months. We don't even remember days. We all remember moments when mm -hmm. we look back. Mm -hmm. And so I want our new building to be filled with stories 
of our very, very successful individuals who've gone through our school and made big, made well, done well all over the country. So those stories should be there as well as bring in people like you to come here and tell your stories. No, that's an important part of communication. And and I think also it helps make up for what I find as being appalling gap in in the education that they get. And let me go uh, to to one specific topic. And every time I speak to a bunch of students, I always Mm -hmm. start with with a trick question. I ask them, how many own a telephone? Mm -hmm. And of course, 100% say yes. They look at me, why would you ask such a thing? And then I ask them, how many of you know that when I was your age, it was illegal to own your own telephone? And I'm, I'm always shocked at their complete lack of appreciation for the fact that the U.S. telecom system used to be a statutory monopoly. Mm-hmm. It had become completely senescent in the hands of the Bell system. And it wasn't until the Bell system was broken up in 1983 that we got this golden age of innovation. All of the things that they take for granted now were developed after competition was brought into the market. You know, I look at, at my career, which started, you know, right during the, the, the Carter melees, and we got a 20-year rocket ride starting in eight, 1981 when deregulation and changing expectations for the economy came along. These students seem to be completely unaware of this. They seem to think that 2% growth is normal. How do we get them to uh, appreciate what it takes to, to take an economy like the one we have today and shake it up and get it growing again? I I wonder sometimes whether we ought to have courses in business history or like lectures on business history where we take these significant industries and discuss them. I have to also tell you that part of it is probably our fault as educators. I can tell you that our students study many industries in depth, not just at KU, Mm -hmm. but business students all over the country. So part of it is the industries we choose to emphasize, discuss, and there is great benefit to looking back at history and what has happened. The challenge also is the students want to be prepared for today, and there's so much to discuss. Even if you talk about telephones, we don't need to reach back to the days before regulation. They want to know what happened. I mean, but let me challenge you that. I mean, every high school kid should know the story of the breakup of the Bell system. I, I agree. I'm not questioning that. I guess I may not have said it right. The challenge we face as educators is, here is the time that we have with them. What are we going mm, to emphasize? What are you going to focus on? Yeah, I mean, but I do agree there has to be some emphasis on business history. As for deregulation, I tend to be a huge proponent and believer in it because when I look back to where I grew up in India and see what happened after deregulation, mm-hmm. the impact that it had on creating opportunities, really fostering growth. So that's a story I love to tell but it's, it's a good challenge. You've thrown out a challenge for me. And, you know, and these kids who are going to become voters, who are going to become the suppliers of our, our retirement income, I mean, we look at the two biggest broken sectors of our economy right now, which is healthcare and banking. They're both a mess. They're getting messier and messier, not getting better. And both of them have effectively been commandeered by the government. There's a sense that we're going to fix it with more and ever more regulation. And if they don't understand the story of the breakup of the Bell system, how are they going to wade into this situation and and make a difference? Fair enough. I think you've issued a challenge. I will think about it uh, (laughs) and see how do we incorporate more sense of history and knowledge of what has happened. And that goes to every sphere, don't you think? Because if we're not aware of what has happened in the past, how do we really know Uh, in spite of the fact that it might not perfectly translate into the future, how do we know what has been tested, why it failed, maybe it would work this time? All of these are very legitimate questions to raise. That's important. And part of it, too, so much of this gets filtered through the political lens of the faculty. Can you describe, you know, how the faculty at KU might be different than what you might find at your, you know, East Coast Ivy League University? I was surprised how many folks I met there were intellectually simpatico to free markets. That's an interesting question. I would say that I am hesitant to castigate everybody in an Ivy League school as one extreme or the other. You've had that experience of being a student there. I have not. So it's harder for me to speak to direct experience as a student. I certainly interact with them as colleagues. And I understand what you say in terms of a bias one way or the other. I think in the Midwest, maybe it's our sense of balance. We really do want to make sure that our students hear different perspectives. That does bother me when it's filtered just through one viewpoint, Mm -hmm. because the whole point of higher education is to learn to think for yourself. And how can you do that if your faculty just filter 
everything you read through one particular lens. So perhaps that's an advantage we have. And certainly at KU, inside the business school, if we are not proponents for business, where will that be? Where's so it one come of from? my goals is to make this the most business savvy, business friendly business school. And that does not mean we never criticize bad actors. It does not mean that we say anything any business does is always right, but it certainly means that we are very proud to proclaim the message of the nobility of business. I chose those words on purpose, Bill. Mm -hmm. I don't want us to think of business as a necessary evil. I don't want us to think of business as something to be tolerated. It is to be celebrated. So my students hear from me more times than uh, they may want to about the nobility of business. You're, and you're fighting an uphill battle in our culture. I haven't seen the movie, but I understand the new Lego movie, the evil character in the movie is named Lord Business. And this is what bothers me. I have to tell you, you've touched a raw nerve because when I think of uh, any kind of movie, think of who is the evil person. Mm -hmm. It's always the cruel, evil business person that will enrich themselves at the expense of the world. They would sell their mother, you know, they would sell mm -hmm. their soul. That is so well, not It's a true. Hollywood characterization, and it's infused in our culture. And I think that one of the things we try to do to dispel that is bring business leaders here. Recently, we had Chet Kajo, one of my favorite companies. It's called Quick Trip, QT, a company based out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, but has a presence here in the Southeast, etc. Hugely successful company. Has, and it's a convenience store chain. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Nothing glamorous. It's a convenience store chain. But most but business is not glamorous. It's workaday stuff that makes the economy run. I couldn't agree more. But here's the message that Chet brought in. Not only are they incredibly profitable, not embarrassed about it. It's wonderful. They outperform the S&P. Of course, it's a privately held company. Mm -hmm have done so well, but they're consistently among Fortune's 100 best places to work for. I mean, think about a convenience store chain beating out these big businesses. Let Actually, I want to add a little more mm -hmm. to this about the portrayal of business bill, if I may. The way I challenge the students to question that is, A, bring these executives who bring to life what it means to be a business person, that these are businesses that care about the communities they operate in, that care about their employees, care about the customers. And if they're very successful, fabulous, because that's what a free market is built on, that you provide a better solution than your competitors do. The second thing we do is really encourage them to interact with the businesses. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I'm very proud of. Our students have so much interaction with whether it's a mom and pop store down the road, whether it's Hallmark or Garmin or any of these wonderful businesses we have in our backyard so that they can see firsthand how these decisions are made. What it takes to make a payroll, what it takes to keep your employees from turning over. It's a whole way of life that seems to be lost to the creators of culture on the coasts. And, and you end up with these Occupy Wall Street mentality that uh, dominate the news. I do understand. The other thing we have done to try to influence young people, and that's something that can be done here in the, in the Midwest at KU for sure. I don't know how viable it is across other campuses, but we launched this faculty business connection program whereby we ask our faculty to go spend time with a business of their choosing that's in <laughs> Kansas. It wouldn't UK. that be nice, yeah. And in fact, we had incredible participation. I believe it was like 90% of our faculty went and did that. And here's the key. The lesson is not for the faculty go out and educate these, you know, uh, business people who know nothing. No, the other way around. It's the other way around. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we did. I said, let's approach it with a sense of humility. Go out, spend time with this business person, find out what keeps them up at night, find out what they want in our students. And, and I have to tell you that it's such a small thing to do in my mind, 
but it was so impactful in sending out the message that we are a business school that knows we have to be relevant for business. Otherwise, we ought to just close up shop. No, no. You, otherwise, you get the theories of the professoriate, which have little relationship to reality. I mean, one of the, one of the things I was so happy to do when I was there, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, remember the fellow's name, when I met the state senator that you invited, uh-huh. uh, who has a day job, runs a business, is a successful entrepreneur, and his contributions to being a politician are part-time, which is so he brings all of his experience when reading these bills saying, what are you kidding? This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. We've got to fix this before we pass it. Kansas has this wonderful system where they're part-time senators. As you heard, this is a man who is wildly successful. He's had two big companies. They have worldwide presence. And the pay to be a senator is $9,000 a year. So it's a part-time job, which I love. And we need more business people to to take those Take roles. a rotation, right. It's not a career, it's a rotation. I agree. If we can get that to happen in Washington, the world would certainly be a better place. Well, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I would love to see that. So, so Neely, in, in what sense is your business school uh, contributing to the development of private sector solutions for social ills? I think that's a key benefit and a key contribution that business schools can make. Mm -hmm. We started this project called Kansas Impact Projects, and every student who's admitted into our MBA program, day one, in teams, they're assigned a different cause that they need to work on. And what they are charged with is helping a nonprofit or a civic institution to figure out how to become independent. Revenue streams, independent of, dependence on government grants. So how to navigate themselves away from being on handouts and towards providing benefit to the wider market. Without question. And that has actually enriched their education. There's one program called Independence Inc. where for developmentally disabled adults, so think of the relief for their families of being able to drop off their Mm -hmm. loved ones at this center where they're actually performing some work. The Army used to have them assemble little uh, elements for the parachutes and Mm -hmm. so on. And now when the government grants dry up or if we can find an alternative to that, isn't that better for all of us? So now they're working with retailers to see how do you market this as a way to showcase. Another problem they tackled was mental health because we have the issue of no-shows. A lot of people who seek mental health are the very ones that don't show up for it. And it was wonderful. The institution was convinced that what they needed were more buses, that that's what was Mm -hmm. keeping it away. But our students studied it and said no. That was not the real hurdle. It was reminders, because these folks need many more reminders than others to actually show up for these. Mm. That, those are simple examples. Simple ways they could use their skills to benefit uh, institutions that would otherwise be looked at as charities. Correct. So in the, in the time we have left, we started out talking about the mess the baby boomers made and how we're getting ready to retire. The demographics are shifting. The, there's 10,000 baby boomers a day retiring now. And you look at the uh, percentage of the population that's going to be elderly. How do universities stay relevant when the mix of old to young change? Uh, That is a huge challenge for us. We need to make sure that the next generation is far more productive than any that has come before. As you say, the number of people it takes to support each retiree, if you look at that uh, it's frightening. Action. It is kind of scary. And the other thing we may want to look at is how much longer people live, and therefore, even if they have technically retired, should we have programming for them? Should we do something to make sure that they stay relevant and connected? It's not necessarily so that they get another job bill, mm-hmm. but that they are mentally alert and connected. So universities, I think, might want to rethink that part of it as well. So lifetime, uh, lifetime education rather lifetime than education. four-year education. Right, because think about things like Alzheimer's where they're saying the more alert you keep your brain, the less the likelihood of coming up with those. Or think about even cardiac health where they're saying social connections can make such a big difference. Mm. Why can't universities be at the forefront of that? Well, the business model needs to change because the trajectory that universities have been on in terms of the cost-benefit doesn't look good right now. So that does need to change. Yeah, I have faith that we have so many smart people here that we will figure it out because if we don't, 
like any other industry, we will be supplanted and we'll find ourselves irrelevant to the needs of the marketplace. Well, Neely, with you in charge, I'm sure that won't happen at KU. It's been absolutely delightful speaking with you. I do hope I have a chance to get closer than 30,000 feet to uh, to KU sometime in the future. Thanks for being on the show. Well, you promised you would, so I'm <laughs> going to hold you to it. All right. Thank you, Bill. This is Real Clear Radio Hour with Bill Frezza. You've been listening to Dean Neely Bendapudi from the Kansas University School of Business. When we come back, President Gloria Larson from Bentley University will share her perspectives honed from years in the business world.